Rugrats was one of my favorite cartoons as a kid. It was about a group of babies going on adventures around their house, the store, Reptar on ice, or anywhere the average family might visit for a day. A simple concept, but it worked really well since an audience of children can easily immerse themselves into the world. And I would know, because it captivated my cousins and I when we were little. Every summer break, we were babysat at our grandma's house, and part of our daily routine was to watch Rugrats at 8 in the morning. I think I've seen every episode from the first six seasons at least five times times because of this, and what made the show more relatable for me was that the main cast of Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lil consisted of four babies, and coincidentally there were four of us kids. Our dynamic was nothing like the cast, but at that age you aren't deliberating over whether or not your personality is a Chucky or a Phil. Anyways, the point is that we watched a lot of Rugrats because we liked it, and guess what? Everyone loved it. The show had a lifespan of 12 years, amassing 9 seasons, and that's before mentioning the spin-offs and 2021 reboot. And as of 1999, more than $1.4 billion has been generated on Rugrats merchandise. I can't even quantify that, but when you've got as much clout as Rugrats, you're bound to get a movie. Or three. Most notably is the Rugrats movie. This was Nickelodeon's first animated theatrical release, as well as the first non-Disney animated film to gross more than $100 million at the box office. The plot was about Tommy Pickles, the main character, getting a little brother, and somehow the main cast of babies gets stranded in the woods. I never liked this movie. The first act is great, but the conflicts and moral dilemmas the characters face makes everybody become unlikable. It's also possible that I can't fully relate to the movie, being the baby at home and among my cousins. And can we get rid of these monkeys? They're annoying and overstay their welcome. I will say the ending is satisfying, albeit rushed feeling. Also, David Spade makes a cameo, that's pretty neat. There's dragons out there! I'm a park ranger, not a knight of the round table! Shut up, Richard. Two years later, the Rugrats reappeared in theaters with Rugrats in Paris, this time focusing on Tommy's best friend Chucky and his single parent father. The main cast goes to an amusement park in Paris, where Chucky tries to get a new mother, but his ambition turns into calamity when a stony-hearted woman manipulates his father into marrying her. I really like this movie, the pacing is fast, the songs are great, it got the entire world asking who let the dogs out, and decades later we still don't have an answer. Also the film references The Godfather a lot, and I know it's like the perfect movie, but honestly it insists upon itself. And then there's Rugrats Go Wild, a crossover with the Wild Thornberries, a cartoon I never liked watching. I should probably give it another shot, I've seen the clip of Nigel doing things with his hands and that was funny, but the movie? Yeah. This has no reason to exist. I'm guessing the producers really wanted Spike to have a voice, and with Survivor being the hottest thing on primetime, a parody was a no-brainer. But I do want to highlight Odorama, promotional cards with scratch and sniffs on them that were given away to add a fourth dimension to the film. So when the strawberry shows up, boom, cardboard smell. Please tell me this was Dan Schneider's idea. There's two foot scenes, what's going on? So produced alongside these films were video games, because that was a common practice of the time. I grew up with a couple, but I went ahead and ordered some more online because I will not be caught dead buying Rugrats games in person. So let's kick things off with the Rugrats Movie Activity Challenge. This one's a mini-game collection that transforms some of the film scenes into games. So in chronological order of their appearance, we'll start with Stu's Workshop. The goal is to save Angelica from the Rapture by creating a Rube Goldberg machine. You get a bunch of tools that can only be activated when something hits them, so you need to figure out where to position them all. There's a lot of ways to cheese these levels, and I think that makes it more fun. Next is Traffic Trouble, which you may recognize as Rush Hour. It's a sliding puzzle where you move cars around to get the babies out of traffic. And while this is a simpler version, it's a great addition to the game. Aqua Reptar is a boat driving obstacle course, a point A to point B game, but running into rocks and getting hit by bananas can pop your raft, so really it's just practice for Super Mario Sunshine. Monkey Mayhem is a copy of Circus Atari, it's another game I enjoy, but sometimes the seesaw will not cooperate. Making Tracks is another sliding puzzle, so of course it's good, but the key difference here is that the babies are traveling on the pieces, so it adds a timer that makes this game especially engaging. And before I spend way too much time on the last minigame, there's a bonus this game that randomly appears every few levels you complete, which is a copy of the moose chase from Mickey Mania. I know, really odd pull. The last minigame is Reptar Rhythm, which has nothing to do with a Rugrats movie besides including a black haired Rex Pester, but the songs have no right being this good. There's only five, but I would actually play these if you pass me the aux cable, so here's a sample. Just 
and I can't believe they got the guy for the DK rap into the studio for this one. The city lights are busted out, and everything's lit by flames. After crashing all these parties, everyone's screaming, Raptor saves! Check this out. Raptor's incredible strength is matched only by his intelligence. Every scientific methodical plan warning. Every new optical endeavor countered by the brainy beast. Our only hope now is to give up and hope we'll set up a benign reptilian government. Balanced and fair to human and reptile alike. Is that a bar? So that's the Rugrats Movie Activity Challenge. It's a fantastic collection of minigames, and they all have 10 different levels, which only takes a couple hours to complete. And if you do that, you'll get to see a cheap imitation of the film's ending. So here you go. Our adventures were never really the same again. Now they were even better. <laughs> Next is the Rugrats movie for Game Boy. This one's a side-scroller adventure that doesn't do too bad of a job following the plot of the movie. There's levels in the Pickles house, the hospital, the monkey forest, and even the ancient ruins from the beginning and end of the film, so you can vaguely get a sense of how underwhelming the movie was from playing this. And that's where the positivity ends. This is one train wreck of a game. In most levels, the objective is to reach the end after collecting a certain number of MacGuffins, but the game goes out of its way to make sure you can never accomplish that. The camera is functional, there's a good amount of lead space, but if you turn around by one pixel, you get one of the worst blind spots ever. The only viable way to keep moving on is to slowly inch forward, because you really, really don't want to get hit. Cause if you do, all your collectibles go away. It especially doesn't help that some enemies are placed super unfairly. Climb this ladder, gotta restart. Dude, this bird can't be avoided, and these platforming sections. Ugh. There's blind jumps with physics that never feel right, and good news, if you fall from too high, you die! I eventually discovered how to look up and down, but there's still a few occasions where you have to pray for a safe landing. Sometimes you have to jump on these balloons, which seem to work randomly, it took me a long time to figure out you can just hold the jump button to bounce on them. And the last annoyance is the continue system. Some levels give you a password once you clear them, but the first half of the game hates doing that. You get one after the third level, one after the seventh, and then every level afterwards gets one. So let's just... rot for a bit. I mean, why not? The first level is in Tommy's Dangerous Cellar. If you're gonna have a level down there, you gotta include Mr. Friend, and this game does not deliver. On the bright side, you don't have to collect anything, so you can coast to the end in a straight line. Same with the living room, although you can be a baby walking on a fireplace mantle, so that's something. I like that the TV is playing Rugrats, I mean how conceited can you get? Next is the yard, I only hate this because of the balloon platforming. At this point I didn't understand the camera or balloon controls, so I had a lovely time getting two game overs. And instead of going to the hospital next, like in the film, Tommy and the squad drive there themselves in this auto-scrolling level where you try really hard to not get your parents imprisoned. And then the hospital, good thing we're here because these levels hurt me spiritually. Let's see, uh, look out for genies, eels, crabs, and planes. Here, let me add one. So without context, the next levels will seem like bizarre inclusions, but the film had this gag about the conditions and environments women will perform childbirth under, and the two specific examples shown were a farm and underwater, which are great excuses to spice up the level design. The farm in particular is the worst level in the game. It has these tornadoes that you can barely react to because of the camera locking that'll occur, and the birds on the cloudy areas don't give you any chances to pass them. The undersea level is okay. The goal is right below spawn, so you don't have to explore everything if you don't want to. There is a level based on Tommy's 26 minute session playing Akinator from the film. You can even see Dee Dee and Stu behind this door. And last is this dingy old hospital room. It's out of place if you ask me. Dr. Lipschitz is too eccentric to have something like this in his maternity arts building. Also, Dill's just chilling on the shelf with the lights off, like everything is okay. As you might have deduced, you have to clear all four of these levels to reach the next checkpoint. Or so I thought, because all you need is the key in the genie jamboree and dill. But suffering in the fields is a human right, not a privilege, so I invite everyone to pilgrimage there once in their lives. Then there's a bunch of levels in the forest that are all similar to each other, do another auto-scrolling level, save Dill again, and last is the Okie Dokie Jones level. And I cannot understand what's going on with the overworld cutscenes. Chucky never leaves the hospital, Dill is phasing in and out of reality, Phil is two levels behind, and Lil straight up died. Anyways, here's the congratulations screen. Yeah, we're gonna put that back on the shelf. The Game Boy game got a sequel when Rugrats and Paris premiered, so let's pop her in. Oh, thank God. I already went $1 over my budget. I'm not buying another copy. 
On the bright side, Rugrats and Paris made its way to consoles, so I'll be showing off the Nintendo 64 version. I've actually played this one a lot as a child, and it's the main reason I'm making this video. You wouldn't believe it, but I've been wanting to play this game for the channel since 2013, and it's not even close to being one of my favorites. This was a game my sister and I liked to see how far we could get in a single sitting, since the game needs a memory card to save, and all our cards were dead. And even more noteworthy is that this is the only video game I've left powered on overnight to try and complete in the next morning. And, well, it never panned out. For the plot, the game loosely follows it. The baby's goal is to find the princess of Euro Reptile Land, who is being held hostage by Robo Snail. According to Kimmy, this is the only real cutscene in the game, and surprisingly, Tommy doesn't speak at all. I guess the devs couldn't afford EG Daily, but that's okay, since Rugrats in Paris is Chucky's story, so I'll be hearing him talk every 10 seconds this playthrough. <laughs> To save the princess, the babies need to get the helmet that controls the Reptar animatronic, and for some reason it's behind the prize counter for 16 gold tickets, which is the collectible you receive from completing mini-games that are mostly based on activities you'd find at an actual amusement park, like bumper cars, whack-a-mole, skee-ball, and mini-golf. There's only 12 mini-games in total, and a lot of them have small annoyances about them that ruin the experience. To win at Ski ball you'll have to consistently sink your ball in the 100-point target, which can be done by tapping left on the D-pad three times and throwing the ball at max power. But the angle is inexplicably different every time, so I can straight up miss where I aim. Another game with terrible aiming is Baseball Toss, and this one you have to hit moving and stationary targets, but the top corners of the map have these weird blind zones where the reticle doesn't match where your character will throw the ball. The bumper car is featured five times, and its minigames are all just okay. Like in this one you're battling with three other characters to have the most balloons at the end, but you can lose balloons by getting bumped into, and sometimes you'll lose balloons for hitting someone, so the game devolves into running away once you have a dozen points. The bumping feature returns in this air hockey minigame where you face off against a security ninja, which I think was a good choice. The ninja chase scene is one of my favorite parts in the movie, and in the game, the ninja won't shut up. At least I know the alphabet. I think. At least I know the alphabet. I think. <laughs> I love this guy. I'm so proud of him. Anyways, your points are stored as balloons, so at the beginning of every round when you and the ninja face off at the center, you can lose a point for absolutely no reason. One way this game redeems itself for me is with its level design. Euro Reptar Land is divided into five different parks that you get to run around, and I think they all do a fantastic job with their theming. The main entrance of the park has this giant reptar statue that roars every so often, and it scared me as a kid. <laughs> Dude, just say hello like Paul Bunyan, you're making children cry. This part of the park works perfectly as an opening world with its color scheme, and while I'd love to see more attractions around here instead of a bunch of walls, for a game of its era this is totally passable. And I can't talk about the overworlds in this game without mentioning the controls. Rugrats in Paris uses tank controls, which isn't preferable, but since the game is just a walking menu, I don't think it's a big deal. I wish your character would move faster, but then I randomly discovered that using the D-pad speeds you up significantly. If the speedrunning community hasn't discovered this yet, you're welcome. And I just need to point out how inconsistent height is in this universe. Some buildings are baby height, some buildings are adult height. Chairs and tables are properly scaled. And then there's the monorail. Whose idea was this? The next park is Ooey Gooey World, which is an actual location for the film, and a treat to see in all its suffocation hazard glory. This is the type of location real video games are afraid to pull off. And look at that leaky ceiling. <laughs> Ugh. Reptar Island has a perfect atmosphere for a beachy jungle resort. I especially like the hallways you get to walk through, and the massive building dedicated to bumper cars makes this a location I would love to visit. Princess Theater is themed after Japan, which has a heavy amount of influence in the film. There's a massive tori at the entrance, and the use of reds and beiges on all the walls helps in making this park feel foreign. And last is the golf park, which is covered in rolling greens. There's a couple entrances to this warehouse where the Reptar animatronic is being stored, and I always found it really unsettling that Reptar is breathing. I was afraid it could start chasing me at any second, even though the control helmet is locked up at the prize booth. You know what else scared me? There's a minigame based on the Chuck E. Chan song in the movie, and it's the easiest one if you aren't cowering under your bed. Another easy minigame, and the best of the bunch, is Whack a Ninja. In the later rounds, it adds dummy bears you have to avoid hitting, and that inclusion makes this the greatest whack-a-mole simulator in gaming history. And we can't talk about good minigames without mentioning Mini Golf, which is apparently a staple in Rugrats console games. There's nine holes of fun, and they all represent the different areas of the park, and there's a couple based on France and Japan too. Now ladies, start lining up because I may or may not have the world record. 
Some of the minigames have two tickets you can acquire, and this is where Rugrats and Paris goes from moderately easy to make you rage hard. In the minigames where your score is being tracked, a bonus round is unlocked if you have a perfect score, and clearing that one rewards you with another gold ticket. Luckily, there's enough golden tickets you can find to avoid getting any perfect scores, like these puzzles you can pay to play, and this stupid fetch quest each baby has in the warehouse. But now that I've got 16 gold tickets, let's buy the helmet and return to Reptar. The Mad Men at Avalanche Software wanted children to know pain, so they made the most difficult final boss in gaming history. You get limited ammo that can take out half of Robocell's health if you're lucky, then all you get is this pathetic scratch attack. And what makes this worse is that Robocell has the same attacks as you, but they're faster. So the only way to win is to run away until more ammo respawns. I happen to discover an exploit in the AI where hiding in the street makes Robocell constantly drive into a wall, so you can get free fireball attacks in. And then the final cutscene. Oh lord, it's not worth it. Harder level? Turns out you can bump up the difficulty, which increases the number of gold tickets you need to collect. So I went ahead and... Rugrats in Paris also received a PC game, which I don't own, but it's got Donkey Kong and Breakout. The overworld gameplay is actually very similar looking to the Rugrats Go Wild video games, which released on PC and the Game Boy Advance, and this time both versions are mostly identical. The gameplay will be a bit different, but both will leave you equally disappointed. I'm playing the GBA version, which starts with a slideshow of lore, and on the PC version it's narrated by Susie, aka Queen Cree Summer, so already I'm shortchanging my Myself. And on the island, there's blue energy, which equates to milk. Like, what are we sucking on it? And don't forget the purple ball stat. I talked to Chucky and Donnie, and now the game's a side scroller. There's a few levels like this where you have to genocide all of God's creatures with your purple balls while using some of the worst jump and throw controls ever conceived. At the end, a boss appears, like this crocodile, which blocks your attack if you hit it too fast or too slow, and I swear I'm gonna strangle it if I had to spend one more minute on this fight. There's also these mini games where you drive from a top down perspective, trying to collect more tit balls and a baby leopard. And then you can just get casually eaten by a leopard. That was pretty kind. This particular minigame makes you drive the Convy, and an endless stampede of park ranger cars keeps stealing the thing you're trying to collect. Ain't that just higgledy piggledy. Higgledy piggledy. The real gameplay is that Tommy and the girl from the wild thornberries, what's her name, were helping Eliza find her dad. Tommy, you can't say that word anymore. Who taught it to you anyways? Along the way you'll find fish and boots and saucy magazines and jar. I already made that joke. Yeah, here's what you do. You pick up the items and the final boss is a crab. So that's how the babies found their family. It's no surprise that video games based on TV shows and movies don't turn out great. They typically get a small budget and a short development time to reach the release deadline. Sometimes you might find a gem, but a lot of them are going to be hot garbage. That's why nobody mentions Scavenger Hunt when talking about the legacy of Rugrats. Thanks for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to leave a like as well with the channel grow and subscribe to get updates on uploads as soon as they happen. But until then, I will see you all next time.